This podcast is brought to you by Prolongevity, the award-winning eight-week program that can transform the lives of people with prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and many other lifestyle-related illnesses. Founded by Graham Phillips, the pharmacist who gave up drugs. Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of the Prolongevity podcast. And we've got a real treat for you, uh, Dr. Brett Scher. Now, I've known Brett for some years through Diet Doctor, and as you know, we're, we're subscribers to Diet Doctor. And some ooh, months ago, I think maybe a year ago, Brett interviewed me uh, on behalf of Diet Doctor. And today, the hunter has turned gamekeeper or something like that. Um, I'm turning the tables on Brett and in- interviewing him in turn. But here's the thing. So um, the conversation we had um, previously around diet doctor was really very much about cardiometabolic health. And I'd never met Brett in person until recently. As many of you know, I went to the low carb conference in Denver. I must say I'm still buzzing from that conference. There was so much good stuff. I had the most amazing time. I met a load of people, including Brett face-to-face who've been on the podcast or I've been on theirs, but I'd never physically met them. Um, it's like being among your, your tribe. And um, I, we've released a previous podcast recently with uh, Corey Jenks, the pharmacist, the other pharmacist who gave out drugs who compared that conference. And I would recommend going and reviewing the videos if you haven't, haven't done so already. So, Brett, I mean, you should, you're a cardiologist, right? You should be out there prescribing statins and stenting people what went so terribly wrong for you yeah great question and and thanks for having me on the show today graham um you know ever since i started in cardiology i always knew i wanted to focus on prevention and my uh, my fellowship was a combined preventive and general cardiology fellowship uh, but when i got into practice i was still practicing general cardiology in the cath lab in the icu and in the office trying to do a mix of everything and It didn't take long to really see sort of the frustration in the kind of a lack of an impact that we were having. There is this sort of, I don't know, you could say psychological approach or mental approach to say that, you know, we put a stent in someone, they're fixed, they're good, away they go. Then they come back six months or a year later, and, you know, there was a bit of this revolving door. Not for everybody, right? I don't want to say this was the case for everybody, but for the majority of people, we just weren't doing enough to prevent them from coming back. And we weren't doing enough to really improve the quality of life and get them taking care, taking initiative for their own health and and taking charge of their own health. And prescribing the statin doesn't do that. Putting the stent in doesn't do that. You really need to sit down and focus on what they can change in the way they live live their lives um, to be healthier and, and live longer and live better. And that's the key. So it, it didn't take me long to realize that you know, the traditional cardiology practice really wasn't set up for that. And so what I really started to do was focus on metabolic health and cardiometabolic health. Um, And the way you do that is with nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress management, not with your prescription pad. So, um, you know, that that's really when I started to see, ah, this is how I can help people. This is how I can really impact people. Even then, though, there was a bit of a barrier because the traditional eat less, move more advice, like we know, doesn't work for the majority of people. It's harder to stick with. It it, creates hunger and cravings. And and so it took a sort of a different lens for that as well. Um, And that's sort of when I really found low carb and keto and like this whole different world that has existed. People have done it and it's been in the literature and it's been in books, but I was never taught it. So I had to sort of learn all that. And that started me on this whole other journey, which led the diet doctor. Um, and then now to metabolic mind, which is another shift, which I'm sure we'll get to. But, but that's why I'm not the traditional cardiologist anymore. It just, for me, it didn't work in terms of helping my patients. And that's what I want. I want people to be healthier and live better. And statins and stents aren't the way to do that. 100%. And what struck me is, you know, um, my good friend, Asim Alhotra, and he describes a really very similar thing. He's also a, I call him the crusading cardiologist. You never know which part of the world he's crusading in. Um, but I, 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 we had the same conversation that he just stented someone and the guy kind of wakes up uh, and, and he's in the hospital, in the hospital bed. And this is doctor, you, but you're saying all this to me. Look what you've just given me, like a McDonald's beef burger for my lunch. How did that happen? And the world's mm-hmm. dominated by that. And that I think set, I seem thinking about all of this. 
Was there a particular event or series of events that moved you in this direction? You know, I couldn't I can't say Yeah, it was it was a general feeling of I'm not impacting people the way I want to impact them. And it was a accumulation of, you know, could not comply with lifestyle. Lifestyle interventions didn't have the effect we wanted. Um, you know, return for his second stent still having angina and it, it just it it was enough of a groundswell of this. Now, one of the things I did was I started Boundless Health, which was sort of like a boutique wellness center. And I was working with a friend of mine who fortunately for me was very knowledgeable in, in nutritional ketosis. And at the time I knew nothing about it. This is, you know, 10 so plus years ago. Um, and so fortunately for me, he introduced me to this concept and, and encouraged me to read about it and learn about it and try it myself and try it my patients. And that's really what sort of started that shift. But um, it is still criminal to see what people are being fed in the hospital. You know, pancakes with syrup and yeah. and jello and pudding when they're when they're there for type two diabetes, you know, with complications from type two diabetes or heart disease. Or, it, it really is criminal and and medicine has a long way to go to catch up. But hopefully conversations like this, meetings like low carb Denver, just continuing to spread the word and raise awareness will hopefully start to sort of chip away um, at these at these old practices that just die hard. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember who I first heard this from. It might have been Gary Fetke, who's, you know, this thing about once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. And once you start practicing this way, it's literally impossible to go back to the old way of practicing. You just you right. just can't do it, right? Impossible. Right. Right. Now, so, I, I do have to clarify, though. I mean, uh, when I talk about stents and statins, look, if I am in the middle of a heart attack, I want that stent. Want. I want that interventional cardiologist who knows how yep. to put stents in, and I'm going to take my statin after I have a heart attack. But that's not yep. where my treatment ends. Absolutely, that's not where it ends. That's just the, the tip of the iceberg, and the rest is my lifestyle. You know, for prevention, totally different story. But in that setting, stents and, and statins can be potentially life-saving. No, and I agree, Brett. I'm glad you raised that. I'm I'm always very careful about this, which is I'm not part of any cult. I'm not part of the keto mm -hmm. cult, and I'm not part of a cult that says no one should ever take a drug ever. Um, I'm a pharmacist. I know all about numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm. And there are mm -hmm. absolutely people who sh who do need stenting, as you described, and there are people who are ben will definitely benefit from a statin. My angst, my my problem with all of that is we're too ready to intervene and too many people end up on statins who don't benefit and probably it does for them more harm than good rather than targeting those who do. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very aware of this kind of cultish, you know, the diet wars. And if you're not in my cult, then, then you're the enemy. I, I completely agree with you. Um, and it must be avoided at all, all costs. We don't want to sort of substitute one extreme for the other. There, there is a, a sort of sensible middle middle path yeah so you alluded to it because as you said when you interviewed me you were uh on behalf of diet doctor and again i think it's a fantastic resource and now you're with um the bazooki foundation so tell us a bit about that and, and how you ended up there yeah it really um was uh just such a unique opportunity and such a wonderful group so bazooki group really led by by Jan Ellison Bazuki and her husband Dave Bazuki is a non profit um and metabolic mind is a non profit initiative of Bazuki group really to help educate about this intersection between metabolic health and mental health and it came about because Jan and Dave's son Matt um has bipolar one and he had a particularly challenging course with and could not find treatment. He was manic and psychotic and in and out of treatment facilities and homeless, living behind a dumpster, you know, and like these are these are the kind of stories that end tragically all the time. They end tragically. For, fortunately for the bazookis, it did not end tragically. And a big part of that was because they found Dr. Chris Palmer and they found uh, Dr. Georgie Ede and, and Beth Supak Kanye and they, and they learned about nutritional ketosis and were able to um, start Matt on nutritional ketosis, on a keto diet, which really did transform his entire uh, recovery and treatment. And he is now well, not just like treated bipolar, but well, as as his mom, Jan, likes to say, with no stigma of mental illness, living the life they never thought he was ever going to live again. Um, so, I mean, that is just so dramatic. And the, that impact of one person 
changed his entire life around, changed the family's entire life around. So thankfully, uh, you know, the bazookis are incredibly intelligent, motivated, philanthropic uh, individuals. And now they are devoting uh, a lot of their time and energy towards spreading this message and funding the research. And they were looking for someone to take over, um, take charge of Metabolic Mind to really help get this information out there. And boy, when I met them and went to a conference they had um, and kind of learned about this movement, it was just inspiring. It was so inspiring. And at first I thought, I really have to help them find the person for this role. I mean, I want to help them find the perfect person. You know, I'm a cardiologist. It's, it's not me, but I'll help them find the right person. But then as I heard, you know, learn more about it, I realized what they needed was a metabolic specialist who can communicate um, yeah. properly, right? This balance of the enthusiasm, the anecdotal reports, the clinical experience, the science that's catching up. How do we combine that? And how do we educate people about that? I realize this is the position I want because the impact we're going to have on the field of psychiatry, the field of mental health, the individuals and their families is, is enormous. And I, and I liken it to cardiology that, you know, there's this intersection between metabolic health and, and cardiac health. There's cardiometabolic health that, you know, 10 years ago, not many people were talking about. Now more people are talking about, it. well, psychiatry is at that same sort of precipice that we're just starting to see the conversation shift towards metabolic psychiatry. We're hearing that term over and over again. And we can help shape that and shape the way psychiatry is practiced and use resources from Dr. Shivani Sethi and, and Chris Palmer and Georgia E and, and so many others in this field um, to help promote the work they're doing to really further this field and change the way medicine is practiced. So it's pretty exciting because, yeah, I love talking about it. I'll keep talking about it because I'm super excited about it. Yeah, You, you do. I mean... No one would say that you're not a consumer um, communicator, um, um, but the obvious enthusiasm but, uh, that you've you've adopted for this, it, it comes across in spades. You know, it's very hard to have the same enthusiasm when you're practicing in a conventional way, is it? You just keep on going mechanically, but it's not <laughs> it, it's not inspiring. It's not enthusiastic, uh, you know. And I'm guilty. I you know for many years practiced. I was trained conventionally. I practiced conventionally. And it's funny, just before I spoke to you, um, I had a potential client. And this guy is a young black guy in his early, well, mid-40s, hypertensive. And he described to me what his path has been. Um, and they started on, as you, as you will know very well, hypertension in black people is different from a hypertension in Caucasians. And the approach... Um, uh, the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics are different because they've got different genes. So the approach is slightly different. And as I said to him, you know, in the Asian community, this tends to play out first and foremost as diabetes, whereas in the black community, it seems to play out more as hypertension. We all end up in the same dreadful state, but there is a, it's a difference. So they started on amlodipine, and now they're adding more and more. I think I was 47. So I said, okay, what do you want? He said, well, I don't want to be taking all these tablets. And it's clear to me that I'm just getting worse and they keep adding more. And I just want to get off that, you know, roundabout roller coaster, whatever. Has anyone ever asked you what you're eating? And he's not, the guy's not overweight and he's exercising, right? What could possibly go wrong? Mm -hmm. So I asked him what his diet was. And his diet is basically sugar, carbs, and fructose, in essence, right? No one's even asked him about his diet. So it's small wonder to us that he's got way too little protein, far too much sugar. Um, no one's even asked him. And I'm fairly confident it's early days that we can reverse that. In 10, 20 years' time, that guy will end up with diabetes. He'll end up with a heart attack or a stroke. He'll have a miserable, he'll die 10 or 15 years earlier than he needs to. He'll be on a ton of medication. They'll have lots of hospitalizations, cost the health system a fortune, and have a pretty miserable 10 or 15 end years of life, right? And that's the trajectory that we see, right? We just improve yeah. it a bit. This guy doesn't need to go down that path at all, and I hope that he will join our program, and I hope you know, he'll, he'll have a diff very different future from that. So I'm seeing the sort of cardiometabolic health stuff all the time. Mental health is, of, is also an interest in mine, not least because both my parents have had lifetime mental health problems. Mm -hmm. So my father's mm -hmm. bipolar. And as a kid, I didn't know that. I just remember as a small child, 
a sort of black, dark presence hanging over the over the house. And that went on for years. And my mum was just coping. We just never did anything as a family because my ba- basically my dad worked. He's a pharmacist too, as it happened, worked and slept. And all his energy, he could just about get himself to work. That's all he could do. Then he would come home and, and sleep because he was in so much emotional pain. And that was the life. And possibly uh, uh, reactive, I don't know, my mother had, has a long, very slow uh, cycle of depression. So I was brought up in a house. I didn't know as a kid, that was just the house, right? I was brought up in a house fraught with mental illness, with a lot of um, pain. And I'm incredibly grateful because I've never suffered. But I can absolutely see what it's like to live in a house like that, what the ramifications are for the family. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted now because um, this, this feels like the second part of my journey, if you like. I've got an understanding of the relationship between what we eat and what we might call metabolic syndrome, cardiometabolic health. In other words, type obesity, in, my, in a lot of cases, but not necessarily obesity. It's where the fat is rather than the amount of it. Type 2 diabetes, dementia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, right? These big killers. It's been absolutely fascinating for me to begin to understand how all those link with mental health. Mm-hmm. And this is where I think our conversation really starts to take off. Yeah. Now, one of the problems it really is that it's quite easy to numerically define cardiometabolic health, right? You can measure someone's blood glucose. You can measure their HbA1c. You can measure their systolic blood pressure. Um, objective measurements, which play into a clinical picture. That is much less true in mental health. And defining good, it, you can kind of see poor mental health when you see it, but defining yeah. what good mental health is as a trajectory, as a treatment goal, in itself, I think, was fraught with difficulty. And I wonder what your take is on on all of that. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%. And I think, you know, as a as a cardiologist, I'm it, going into this field, I remember reading right, the Hamilton Depression Score, the uh, the PQ nine, the the positive and negative symptom score, and I'm thinking, what are these things? Like, I, how do you know, you know that? But that's how you measure someone's um, symptoms for mental illness, um, and it, it is really so. Um, I guess you could say isolated in, within the world of psychiatry that that most other doctors don't even know what these letters mean or what they exist. But it, they are subjective measurements. It's not a blood test. It's not a CAT scan. It's not an MRI. It is a subjective measurement. And and that's got good and bad. But I think one of the bad is then, you know, you can fall back to objective measurements, which is, are they committing suicide? Are they being hospitalized? Are they committing crimes? And to prevent that, treatment falls on a lot of sort of heavy sedation and um, medications, yeah. which in the right setting can be life-saving, right? If someone is acutely psychotic or manic or or severely depressed, those medications can be life-saving. But over the long term, they may keep someone out of the hospital, they may keep some, someone from being a harm to themselves or others, and they completely diminish their quality of life too, that they're not living a vibrant life. So that's the balance. And again, not in everybody, but in a large percentage of the people. So, And that's where the treatment of, psych, uh, of uh, the, the psychi- psychiatry treatment, I guess you could say, or the treatment paradigm really sort of falls short. And that's exactly what um, Jan and Dave Bazuki saw with their son, Matt, that, that he was being treated, but he wasn't thriving. Um, and so we hear it all the time that the medication saved my life, but, but my lifestyle is what gave me my life back. And that's what people can yep. see with nutritional ketosis, with adequate sleep and paying attention to circadian rhythms, with regular exercise, with getting off the drugs and alcohol, that that's what gives them their life back. And especially for those who have been treatment resistant or having side effects of the medications or, you know, so it's this, it's this mix. And that's where the whole field of psychiatry and primary care, because so many primary care docs take care of patients with mental health yeah. issues. That's where we really have to sort of change this paradigm. And it's not, you know, the first step may be keeping them safe, but the second step is helping them thrive. And that's where I think nutritional ketosis yeah. is going to play such a big role. And that's, 
you know, one of the things that I like to talk about with nutritional ketosis is it's, it's not a treatment for depression or bipolar or schizophrenia or anxiety. It's a treatment for brain health and also for potentially Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's very clear that the brain works better, especially in sort of a malfunctioning brain with energy dysfunction, that it works better when it's working on ketones and improved metabolic health. And so it's a potential for anything involving the brain. And that's why you had started treating epilepsy 100 years ago. Yeah. So it's, it, that's what I find so fascinating, just this, this concept of improving brain health, which then can improve anxiety, can improve symptoms of bipolar disorder, can improve symptoms of schizophrenia or depression or Alzheimer's. And we're starting to see this evidence show there's, there's plenty of you know, anecdotal reports, clinical experience that's growing and growing. And now the science is starting to catch up as well. And it's really an exciting time to be, to be on this. It, it really is. You've mentioned nutritional ketosis. Let's not assume people understand what mm. that is. Um, yeah. If people hear of ketones and ketoacidosis, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, there's always something out there that tells you it's going to kill you. So what, uh -huh. what do we mean by nutritional ketosis and, and how do we achieve it? And who, does, who is it right for? Yeah, great question. So nutritional ketosis is a bit of a broad term. It just means you're eating in a way that allows your body to produce ketones. And what that means is you're burning fat for fuel primarily. So, I mean, you could talk about evolution. We don't know exactly what we ate or how we lived in evolution, but we can make guesses. There were times where there wasn't a lot of carbohydrates available, especially during the winter or especially if you lived in certain parts of the world or whatever. So you can, you can see how we at least were in and out of ketosis where we were not burning carbs, we were burning fat, our own body fat, the fat we ate. And when your body burns fat, one of the byproducts is ketones. And ketones can also be used for fuel, especially in your brain. Now your brain can't run 100% on ketones, but it can run maybe up to 70% on ketones with 30% on glucose. Um, and that doesn't mean you need to eat any glucose because your body can make its own glucose. So that's the other concept that, you know, we need yeah. a certain amount of carbs so that our body can run on glucose. No, 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 no. Your body makes all the glucose it needs. But that's what we mean by nutritional ketosis, that your body has switched, your metabolism has switched from burning carbohydrates and glucose to burning fat and in the process producing ketones, which can also be used for, for fuel. Now, in this, you know, experiment we've had over the past century with our diet, <laughs> That's where we've become carbohydrate and glucose burners all the time. We constantly, 100% of the time, burning glucose for fuel, never tapping into our fat stores. And that's, the, that's sort of the freakish experiment, not nutritional yeah. ketosis. Nutritional ketosis is what we have been doing, at least in and out of. It's the 100% glucose burning that is the freakish experiment that is not going very well for a population. So, so that's what I mean by nutritional ketosis, eating in a way that allows your body to produce ketones and burn fat for fuel. Completely. Um, and isn't it amazing how Homo sapiens has eaten a particular way for the best part of the 2 million years of evolution, and then the food industry came away and came and changed all our diet. We got fat, diabetic, sick, all these new diseases. Now we need a clinical trial. There was no clinical trial before we changed the diet, right? We just changed right. the diet. Right. Why did we change right. the diet? Well, we were convinced it was healthier by vested interest of the food industry. Now they say, no, you can't go back without a clinical trial. So the two million year right. clinical trial means nothing. The last 100, 150 years of eating ever more ultra processed food with fake facts and more carbs and all of this, that's fine. We need a clinical trial to go backwards. And what I say is just let's look at humans at their most vulnerable, which is in utero and neonates, breastfed babies, and they're in ketosis, right? So either evolution is completely stupid or that's how we're designed to be. Yeah, it's a really interesting perspective, but it's, that's not the perspective the food companies and the pharmaceutical industries um, wants us to have. But I think it's a, a very good perspective that would help a lot of people open their open their minds a little wider when they see it from those from that yeah. perspective. Yeah. So we've started to discuss mental health, but I I don't know unless you're really 
have members of the family who suffer or you suffer yourself or you're a health professional, people don't understand how wide and broad it is, how common it is, what the incidence is and what the trajectory is. Because um, certainly my understanding is that particularly through COVID, but over a sustained period, mental health has got steadily worse mm -hmm. and the consequences. And I thought you might want to say a bit about that because I've certainly got some strong views. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, and, and even before COVID, you know, a, a psychiatric diagnosis, a mental health diagnosis is, is the number one cause of disability, of work disability. And, you know, you look at something like bipolar disorder and with the, the age group of 18 to 25, you know, 4% of the population uh, has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I mean, that's 4% of the population in that age group. That's huge. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, with severe impairment and, and you know, loss of loss of enjoyment, loss of productivity, and and unfortunately, loss of life because the suicide attempt rate is is incredibly high. And or you look at something like anorexia, which has the the worst prognosis of me any mental health um, or mental illness. Um, and it, current treatments have not really improved things. Um, that's one of the the main depressing things about this is it's not new. That this is, you know, so dangerous and and potentially lethal, and in such a leading cause of disability. Those aren't new, but yet the treatments haven't made substantial improvements. Not to say there haven't been any improvements, right? There's there's always a little bit. The drugs a little bit better, or this this you know um, uh, magnetic stimulations a little bit better, right? The, the small improvements, but that's not what we need. We need broad sweeping changes. And it frequently just comes back to, like you've said, like asking people what they're eating, asking people how they're living their lives, help them change their physiology um, back to ways that are more conducive to brain health. And that's what's so, I guess, encouraging and frustrating at the same time that we have this massive problem yeah. and we have the tools that can address it. It's just connecting those dots. It shouldn't be so difficult. Um, but it is. And like you said, now all of a sudden we need research to show this. And fortunately, Bazooki Brain Research Fund is funding a number of trials um, to look at nutritional ketosis for mental illness. Um, and we're going to start to see these, the results coming very shortly. So it's it's going to be very exciting. But I mean, you started this question by talking about the the scope of the problem. And, and there's no question it, it's, um, it is a major issue and growing. And so we need to get creative, we need to get ag aggressive to address it. And the same old, same old isn't going to do it. Yeah. And I definitely want to come back to, about the research projects that Bazooki are funding at the end, because I think this is so important about the future. I don't know whether it's as big a theme in the States, but certainly among healthcare in the UK, there's a huge theme about health inequality and preventable early death. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, in London, if you start on the underground, the tube subway at Westminster, and you go in any direction within five stops, at each stop, life expectancy goes down by two years. So mm -hmm. you go 10 stops, like 20 minutes on the underground, life expectancy drop by at least 10 years. And we know, for example, a, a blue collar worker in Ed, in Edinburgh or Glasgow, has a 20-year less life expectancy than a white collar who lives down in the south. So I always say, if you're roughly 70 years old and you're living in Edinburgh, get on a train south, because it's going to add 20 years to your life, right? Yeah. We also know that mental health is a death sentence. It's the health inequality of all health inequalities. And I don't know the stats in the States, you might, but in the UK... Generally, it's 20 years off your life. Hmm. It's as stark as that. We're doing as badly yeah. as that. Yeah. And the other statistic I've trot out a lot, because I've done, I, I, men's health has always been an interest of mine. I've done a lot of work in that particular area. Um, single cause of preventable death, preventable death in men aged 45 and under. And if you ask people what it is, they think they're going to get it's getting drunk and falling off your motorbike or falling out of your hang glider or something, it isn't it? It's suicide. It's suicide, right? The 
the, the absolute tragedy and loss of human life at that level as the single biggest cause of preventable death in, in young men. So this is not no small deal. This is to me that I'm trying to give it some context. And I guess I'm trying to explain to our audience why you and I are so incredibly passionate about this. Right. Um, right. So explain to me, because I'm beginning to understand it, the link between cardiometabolic disease, so the diabetes, the obesity, et cetera, et cetera, and poor mental health. How does it all mm. connect? Because I'm only now beginning to understand the links. Once it's explained to me, it makes sense. In fact, you think, obviously, right? Because the brain's not separate from the body. Yeah. But we're beginning to have a proper understanding of how all that links. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, as Dr. Georgia Ede likes to frequently say, the last time she checked, the brain was connected to the body. So it's probably time we start treated, treating it like that. And, and yeah. so, so right. Um, but if you look at it, what is, what is metabolic dysfunction? Metabolic dysfunction is uh, inability to properly and efficiently use glucose for fuel. So it's about fuel production. It's about energy production, fuel usage and energy production. And it's dysfunctional. Well, that's going to affect your body. That's going to affect your insulin secretion. It's going to affect your glucose levels, and it's going to affect you know, can affect inflammation. It can affect so many different things downstream. Well, the same thing happens in your brain. Your brain, if it's not effectively producing energy, that is going to have a set of results of symptoms, and is not always the same. It's it, you know, there's a lot of individuality about how it presents, but the underlying concept is the same. Poor energy production, poor usage of fuel, dysfunctional um, energy production. And um, like Dr. Chris Palmer in his book, um, Brain Energy, brings it down to the mitochondria. So whether you have, you know, wherever your mitochondria are, if they're not producing energy efficiently, there's going to be a consequence of that. So the consequence can be type 2 diabetes. The consequence can be coronary disease. The consequence may even be, you know, fueling cancer cells so they can grow faster. Or the consequence may be a mental illness, whether it presents as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or uh, severe depression, or it may worsen something that's already existing, such as anxiety or PTSD or OCD, right? There, it's, and, and that's what's, I guess, sort of really interesting, but also for some hard to grasp. It's like, wait a second, how can one person, it presents as psychosis, and another person, it presents as depression, and another person, it presents as Alzheimer's, right? Well, I, I don't know. I can't say exactly what it is about each individual, but we know it it happens. Now, is you know, is the metabolic dysfunction the only thing, the only cause? No, you know, genetics, epigenetics, you know, our environment, so much plays into that, but it's clear that they're related. So when you fall back on the science, you can say, look, the, the evidence is clear. Those with type 2 diabetes have a higher risk of depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and those with serious mental illness have a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. So there's this, this two-way street that there's this clear relationship. Then you could take it even further. Dr. Cindy Calkin, who I recently had on my podcast at Metabolic Mind, um, she did a great study showing for people with treatment-resistant bipolar disorder who had insulin resistance, if she gave them metformin, so a, a yeah. type 2 diabetes medication that helps with insulin sensitivity, she gives them metformin, and they reverse their insulin sensitivity, their symptoms of bipolar depression decrease significantly and dramatically. And these were sort of the sickest of the sick, treatment-resistant bipolar. And the drug metformin helps. So now all of a sudden you're saying, wait a second, all you're doing is treating the insulin resistance and their bipolar depression gets better. Like that's fascinating. That's really starting to connect the dots. And then another study by Albert Denon in France who took 31 of his patients, um, again, treatment resistant, bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, yeah. put them in the hospital. The only thing he changed was he started feeding them a ketogenic diet. 100% improved their symptoms. 68% um, I think reduced their medications and like 30, 40% were in clinical remission. Like these are statistics that you just don't get by other means, but either by using an insulin sensitizing drug or nutritional approach that improves metabolic health, we're starting to see these results. So the, the dots are really starting to get connected, and it, it's, it's something we can't ignore anymore. We have to pay attention to it. 
I'm pleased you brought that study up, Brett, because I was going to, I was intending to bring that study, actually. Um, and we, we're fortunate, as you know, I'm a trustee of the Public Health Collaboration. We've got our conference in a few weeks in Sheffield, and George Reed is one of our talkers. So we're lo really great. looking forward to see what, what she's got to say. And hopefully some of you guys, maybe next year, someone from Metabolic Mind will, will come and, and talk. Let's dig into that study a bit more. You've outlined it, but I read that study. Well, I read this sort of summary in complete disbelief and bewilderment. And then I read the study and I read it again and then I read it again. Because I have just never seen anything in mental health. Because uh, as I understand it, these are a group of really sick patients. Right. With a lot of illnesses. It wasn't one thing. It was a whole collection of these different, from bipolar to schizophrenia to depression. Mm -hmm. I probably missed that. And they've been very sick for a very long time. And this, uh, and I don't know this condition at all. I don't, do, do you know the, um, the, this, the researcher who originated the study? Do, do you know Albert Denon? Yeah, Dr. Albert Denon. I've met with him. So he's, so at Metabolic Mind, we gave out seven um, awards, Metabolic Mind awards for clinicians in the field of metabolic psychiatry. And he is one of them because of his, the work that he's doing. So I did have the fortune of meeting him and interviewing him and such a lovely, wonderful mm -hmm. individual. Um, with his own story of how he even got into um, looking at ketosis for mental health. So uh, definitely worth hearing his story a, a, as well and a, a great guy. But yeah, so he did this study and you're exactly right. He took patients that he had been seeing for years who were not getting better. They were treatment resistant despite you know aggressive medical treatment, despite traditional care, despite counseling and all the things he would do with his patients. They weren't getting better. And he said, I'm going to try um, nutritional ketosis with this group because nothing else is working and let's see what happens. And the results were phenomenal. I mean, these were people who were not getting better and all of a sudden 100% were improved. And, and I, I apologize if I'm getting the exact numbers wrong, but like 68% were on lower doses of medication and like 30% or so were actually in clinical remission. I mean, it was, it was shocking. And um, with the help of Dr. Adrian Sotomoda, who's a, who's a, another amazing clinician, um, he and I sort of put together looking at comparing the improvements to the improvements for um, drug studies that were used for FDA approval, whether it was for an antidepressant or antipsychotic medication. And the degree of improvements is the same, if not better, from what Dr. Danan saw and what they saw in those drug studies. Now, not randomized controlled trial. We have to address that, right? We have to be upfront. It yeah. wasn't a randomized controlled trial. It was 31 patients with no control arm, but this is how it starts, right? The randomized control trials are coming. They have, you have to start somewhere. And this is just a dramatic and, and fantastic place to start to show what can be done. No, it, it, it was just so inspiring because, you know, these people have been very sick for a very long time. They'd had lots of, you know, endless hospitalizations, all these different drugs thrown at them. It's a one-way street for people like that. And yeah. to get people who've been through all of that and to get them, I think a third ended up in drug-free remission and, a, mm -hmm. and I, not one of them didn't respond positively. And I think not one of them ended up on fewer drugs. Okay. No drug achieves that. Nothing yeah. achieves that. It's to say it's inspirational. I mean, I, you know, you run out of superlatives, but it's it's so yeah. exciting. In the and I, I like the analogy of type two diabetes. You know, maybe five or ten years ago, who talked about remission of type two diabetes? We just didn't talk about it. it. Wasn't in our vocabulary because it didn't happen. Now it seems like remission of type two diabetes just rolls off the tongue because we know. With nutritional ketosis, lifestyle interventions, you can put type 2 diabetes into remission. Same thing for bipolar, schizophrenia, major depression, you know, psychiatric, serious mental illness. Remission, it, you don't talk about remission. You talk about control. And I, I you know, interviewed Chris Palmer, and he says the same thing. He's been in this field for so long. And he says, these don't go into remission. You ask any psychiatrist, they don't go into remission. But now we're starting to talk about remission. And that's what's so exciting. And, and it's really going to change the way we practice uh, psychiatry. And obviously Chris was at the Denver conference as, as well. Yeah. And I have to say, um, his is one of the standout presentations for me. Mm -hmm. Um, it's such a compelling way he tells the story 
And he's been honest in various podcasts that he's had his own issues of mental health. So it's a personal story. Yeah. And you could see how deeply he feels the pain that his patients go through and how, in a sense, how angry he is that these people are continued to be subject to limited improvements and ever more medication. I get that. I, I feel the same. You know, have, having practised for, you know, the majority of my working life as a pharmacist, spooning tablets into people, thinking I was doing the right thing, mm -hmm. while the mm -hmm. drugs got bill got bigger and bigger and they didn't seem to get any better. I'm now angry because I feel that I've been misled and that in, some, in many instances I've done more harm than good. And I, I think all of us feel that to an extent, don't we? We feel very, um, very evangelical and very optimistic about the future, but very angry that actually we could all have been doing this for an entire professional lifetime if someone yeah. are just drawing the dots yeah. at the end, right? We're not stupid people and we get it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. How? Right. Why? You know, but we're all kind of blinded to it, aren't we, by our training? Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's really depressing to think about. When I think about all the patients I saw in my cardiology practice with type 2 diabetes and who I did not offer this to, I did not offer nutritional ketosis as a way to reverse their type 2 diabetes. Because I didn't know about it. I didn't, I, I hadn't done the research. I hadn't looked into it. And I could have helped all those people so much more than I did. And and like you said, you know, everybody in this field sort of feels that way. So I, you know, it's hard to get get past that, but we have to and use that as motivation to make sure that never happens again and to help spread the message, right? Like, uh, sure, I, I see patients in my practice who I can help. But that's one person at a time. What I really want to do is help spread this message. So if you are a cardiologist or a primary care doctor or an endocrinologist that was in the position I was in, that didn't know anything about nutritional ketosis, yeah. and you will learn about it and, and at least be curious enough to look into it and maybe find some resources to, to work with your patients. And now the same for psychiatry, because how many psychiatrists have never heard of nutritional ketosis, have never heard of this metabolic mental health connection? that if they can just start to learn about it and then think about all the patients that they can impact. I mean, that's our mission. That's why we're doing what we're doing to, to get this downstream effect that will change the way we practice medicine and help the lives of countless individuals. I think it will, but I also feel it's helped my life as a health professional mm -hmm. because I just feel so much more optimistic and it's revitalized me. You know, you know, as you know, I'm, quite friendly with Dr. David Unwin, a low-carb low GP. Yeah. It transforms your professional practice mm -hmm. because you go from, you know, another tablet, another dose, not much improving. It's all going backwards. You, all you're trying to do is arrest the decay to absolutely, I mean, I see in eight weeks transformation in my clients I see the light coming back into their eyes. Their inflammation goes away. Their sense of optimism and positivity returns. And it's not just one symptom. Like with the drug, you treat one symptom, two symptoms, and they get a little bit better until you up the dose. You yeah. never see a whole collection of symptoms uh, and quite disparate symptoms all improving at once. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing that. And I just, yeah. you know, I've become a bit funky. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned Dr. David Unwin. One, just he's such a phenomenal human being that is just one of my favorite people in the world. But I remember having dinner with him. I believe it was at Low Carb Denver pre-pandemic and, and really hearing his story, how he was on the brink of retirement. He was like, I'm done with medicine and low yeah. carb, like you're saying, it changed his entire practice. Not even, you know, regardless of all the patients he's helped. It helped him and changed his practice and kept him in medicine. And he's just one example of that. We hear so much about physician burnout or, or nurses burnout or pharmacists burnout, right? There's so much burnout going on. And part of that is feeling like you're a cog in the wheel, feeling like you're not having the impact you want to have, you know, job dissatisfaction. And if you can start helping people, that all changes. That all changes when you can really see the impact of your work helping people. So you're right. This message isn't just for individuals with their own health issues. This is for clinicians with their own professional issues that need more inspiration in their professional life. And, and this is a way to find that for sure. 
So um, I, we've covered a lot of ground in a, in a short time. Um, I do want to return to the work that the Bazuki Foundation are doing, because as you said, we've got extensive clinical trials that show, or, or in my, I would argue, don't show the benefits of statins across hundreds of thousands and millions of people. We've got these trials that seem to show that some of the mental health drugs do a certain amount of good some of the time. I wouldn't really put it much stronger than that. I, I mean, I do sometimes see transformations in fairness. I, um, not in many cases, but there are definitely, I've seen people start a, a CNS medication, an antidepressant, an antipsychotic, and it's life-changing. So I don't want to yeah. say, you know, just to rubbish the whole thing, because I think that would be cultists once more. We, what we need now is a lot more. We've got a good theory about this link between how your cells work, how the uh, mitochondria of the cell, the energy producer of the cell, affects everything and it takes everything, and how if you're not producing energy very well in your cell and you've got a sick cell, that's going to be devastating. It might become cancer. It might become dementia. It might become type 2 diabetes. It might become mania. It might become depression. It might become schizophrenia. But when you realize that these are the same cellular and subcellular mechanisms uh, and dysfunction, but depends on which body system they're playing out in will play out differently, but it's the same process, right? So that's, mm -hmm. our, that's our unifying theory of the whole thing. Broadly, I, yeah. do you think I, is that a reasonable way to put it? I think that is a reasonable way. I mean, uh, it may not be the one and only explanation, but this concept of energy dysregulation, I think, is spot on. Now, it can be hard for some people to initially wrap their mind around sort of like what I said earlier, like why in some people is it type 2 diabetes, why in some people is it Alzheimer's, but at the core, and why in some people would it be, you know, a serious mental illness, but at the core, it, this energy dysregulation certainly makes sense. Um, and improving efficient energy production improves brain health, improves body health, improves metabolic health. It, it is connected. Um, so I think it absolutely makes sense. And that's where you know Dr. Chris Palmer has been so influential with his book, Brain Energy. Yeah. I highly recommend everybody check out that break, check out that book. Um, it's very educational about this concept. Um, and it, it's going to help fit in with this role that metabolic psychiatry is going to play uh, moving forward in, in, in the whole course of medicine. So I do want to come back to the future. And I do want to know what the, your plans are, both Brescia and uh, the Brain Foundation, Metabolic Mind. And where are you with all this? Because I know that there's a series of clinical trials. Just outline to us what the trials are, what you hope they will prove, what you think the timeline will be. Because I do yeah. think this is, this is paradigm shift stuff. This is not the usual incremental, incrementalism we see in, in healthcare, and it's just so exciting. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, from a metabolic mind standpoint, we're, we're, we're really all about putting the education out there, combining, you know, resources and education about this intersection of metabolic and mental health. And so, I've been in the position now, you know, less than six months at this point, but our YouTube channel is growing, our podcast is growing. We're really making an effort to get the information out there. Now, the other part of Bazuki Group, though, is, though, is the Bazuki Brain Research Fund, where there we're um, funding at present five clinical trials with hopefully more coming, two of which are completed and will be presented in June of 2023 at the ISBD conference in, in Chicago. So it's really exciting. So Dr. Shivani Sethi at Stanford and Dr. Ian Campbell at Edinburgh have completed their trials of using nutritional ketosis for serious mental illness and are going to report their findings at this conference. And that's, I mean, like you said, this is paradigm shifting stuff. It's going to be presented at a major bipolar conference, which is very exciting. Um, there's another trial at Ohio State um, in college uh, kids or college adults with depression um, and using nutritional ketosis. Um, there's one at UCSF um, with Dr. Judy Ford and Shivani Sethi again, um, looking again at nutritional ketosis for serious mental illness um, and schizophrenia and bipolar. And then there's one in James Cook University in Australia 
um, that I believe right now is recruiting patients. So these are the five that are in motion, two ready per to present, two ongoing and one about to start. And so it's, we're going to start to see this snowball effect because we're already seeing more research getting interested in it. And that's that's what I find so interesting is 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 more and more researchers are starting to see this and say, we need to look into that. We found about, about one study that was happening in Canada that we couldn't believe we didn't know about. It was already underway. And it's like, we thought we knew everything. Like, it's so exciting that there are you know, research studies popping up that we don't even know about, which just shows how much this is growing. Um, yeah. And so, it, yeah, you know, and I spend a lot of time, um, well, some of the time at, at Metabolic Mind in my videos talking about how we balance this you know, you're a mother of a loved one uh, with bipolar disorder, or you are a clinician treating patients, or you're someone writing um, psychiatry guidelines. What level of evidence do you need to say this is enough? And clearly for the mother who will do anything for their kid, yep. you don't need the randomized controlled trial. If you're the yep. psychiatrist treating the patient, you probably still don't need the randomized controlled trial um, as long as it fits with your clinical judgment and you feel comfortable. If you're yep. writing the guidelines, okay, then you probably need the randomized control trial. But yeah. So that's where we're headed. But by no means should the practice of metabolic psychiatry sit and wait for those randomized control trials because there are people who need help now. When we discuss it, though, we have to be clear. This is based on clinical experience. This is based on you know some observations. This is based on anecdotal reports. But this is how we do it safely. So that's a big, big message of ours at Metabolic Mind that yes, this is a potential intervention, but yes, there are some concerns with it. So it has to be done safely. So we have a whole video based specifically on this, on how to consider starting nutritional ketosis safely. What are the main concerns? And to only do it with a clinician who knows what they're doing and how to have that discussion with your clinician. We have this whole series at our Metabolic Mind YouTube channel about that. So that's that's the present and the future. I mean, the research is catching up and is very exciting, and we're only going to see this grow as we get to that point. But we shouldn't sit and wait for the randomized controlled trials when there are so many people who need our help now. Fantastic. Um, and I think that's a great place to end, really. Is there anything that we haven't covered that, that you'd like to that, that I've missed? Wow. I don't know. It's a good question. We've covered a lot. Um, well, I, yeah. guess, I guess the other part, that I should have talked about a little bit with my personal journey though, is, is, is still, we have to still fight against uh, misconceptions about nutritional ketosis and, yeah. and biases against it. And that's where I think my role as a cardiologist can be helpful um, because it comes down to cardiovascular risk, LDL as being sort of the main pushbacks against nutritional ketosis. And it's frustrating for me just to see how misunderstood this is. You know, like there's this automatic assumption from clinicians that if you start a ketogenic diet, your LDL will go up to dangerous levels and you will increase your risk of heart disease, period, yeah. full stop, no further discussion. Like there's that assumption. Yeah. And it's so misguided and so far yeah. from the truth that that's this other part that we really need to start to help communicate and help people understand better. So they don't think, oh, sure, maybe I'll treat my mental illness, but I'm only going to give myself a heart attack. So what's the difference? Like, no, that is not the trade-off. Not at all. Yeah. I, it's so true. You know, for years, I avoided red meat. Everything was low fat. And I remember the first time I put whole milk back into my coffee, I was waiting for the heart attack. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Fortunately, I'm still waiting. Yeah. But yeah, this whole LDL thing, you know, um, I know there are mixed views, but I'm I'm in the process of listening to Peter Atia's new book called Outlive, mm -hmm. and his view on ApoB is that you know less is less is better and none would be good, right? Yeah, and yeah. Yet, across everything else, he's brilliant about longevity and health, and yet he's got this complete blind spot about uh, statins, LDL, the new PCSK9 inhibitors, and all of that. Right. Yeah. Highly yeah. intelligent guy, right? I mean, he's yeah. got a brain the size of a planet, if we can't yeah. convince people like him, you know, where does it come from? Is it cognitive dissonance? Is it the vested interest of the pharma industry? I, I kind of vacillate between the two. It's probably a combination of the two. But my God, it's a difficult one to crack. Yeah. And I, and I know I brought up the the huge kick the hornet's nest at the very end of our interview yeah. here and brought up this huge topic. But I think 
the, the way I like to summarize it is that, you know, LDL, ApoB, they are defined cardiovascular risk factors for the general population. No question about that. You know, there is a clear association. But the questions are, how big is the association? You know, and what, and, and how does that change when you are otherwise improving your health in so many different ways, but have a slight rise in your ApoB? And, you know, what does it mean for this specific patient population? So it's not that I'm, I'm not in the camp to say LDL doesn't matter, ApoB doesn't matter, you can ignore it. I'm definitely not in that camp, but I'm definitely in the camp that says it is one of many risk factors that you have to factor into the entire picture and can't get just hyper-focused on the one and say it has to be low, period, and don't worry about you know anything else. Absolutely not. It's got to be individualized. It's got to be put into the, the whole picture. And actually, one of the things, there was a quote um, by Dr. For, Dr. Christopher Garner on a on a paper that was supposedly about a keto diet that wasn't about a keto diet, but it really rubbed me the wrong way. And then maybe it was taken out of context. I don't know. But it said, it is clear the risks outweigh the benefits. And I stopped short and I said, wait, what? What, what? benefits are you talking about? Well, you have no idea what benefits somebody is getting because each individual is going to get different benefits. Like you cannot say risk that way the benefits until you know what those benefits are. So anyway, that's, I'm going to go on my yeah. soapbox. <laughs> but so the point is that we just need to individualize this. We can't make just blanket statements, good, bad, whatever. We need to individualize yeah. it because um, we're learning so many different things about how, how nutritional ketosis impacts individuals. Like you said, Brett, you kicked the hornet's nest right at the end and I, I took the bait. <laughs> Um, what I would love to do, Brett, is to get you back another time and actually talk about cardiometabolic health and your own book. Um, you know, I've seen many sure. of your presentations, uh, both YouTube um, and, and at Denver. Um, it's, been, it's been a blast. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for what you do. I don't think you can overstate the importance of a communicator like you trying to communicate this thing, move away from the safe practice, as I say, as I said to Asim, you know, you could just be earning a very nice living, prescribing statins, sustaining people, and actually mm -hmm. you've chosen a much more difficult, but ultimately much more fulfilling path. And I think we're all incredibly grateful for that. You know, all strength, all, more power to your M elbow. Uh, look forward to the results of your research studies. Um, and please keep doing what you're doing. And thank you so much. Thank you, Graham. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation and, and thank you for all the work you're doing. If you enjoyed the podcast and want to find out more, join our Wellness and Pro Longevity Facebook group. Don't forget to subscribe and follow so you never miss an episode and maybe share to friends and family who might benefit. Finally, if you think you might need help with diabetes, heart disease, or any of the other diseases we discuss, then book a free consultation with Graham. There's absolutely no charge for this, and we would never put you under any pressure. What do you have to lose? Bye for now, and see you for the next episode.